Okay, hello everyone, welcome to the channel, I'm DC. Okay, today I have something very special for you. Um, very bright young lady has been working very hard um, and she's actually making a documentary. Now, I've just come across this on Twitter, so um, I just want to show you this. It's the name of the documentary she's making is called Cancer a foodborne illness. Now this I totally believe. More and more I am convinced and the evidence is out there too and as I have presented a few times now, um, you know, so many people are speaking out about this. This is a metabolic disease. Um, it's the same as diabetes, any other illness, obesity and uh, many others. Okay, um, including mental illness, dementia, and other things. But cancer is the big killer at the moment. And, you know, again, it is all to do with the food industry. Okay, what we eat, um, how we are educated to eat as well. Uh, and the, the conflict of interest that, you know, surrounds the, the food industry and the so called governing bodies that are supposed to. Uh, protect the people, uh, educate the people, including, you know, academic uh, institutions, schools, universities, okay, colleges, hospitals, foundations, and, uh, and many more. But um, so I wanted to show you this great documentary that's coming up, and it, it's looking really good. So um, it's, this is just about 20 minutes or so, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's well worth watching and uh, many great people talking about it, so. My name is Grace Price and I am filming documentary. Right now we're waiting to see if any of the people in the reserved spots at the Waterbury headquarters are going to come out for their lunch break. I have a quick question for you. Do you work for Whataburger? I'm really concerned about the health of my generation. Foods that y'all are using. Uh, I'm not. I'm not getting on the video. I'm sorry. I'm running late for it. Okay. Hey, how are y'all doing? Oh. Um, have, uh, we've been kind of having some concerns about about y'all recording this whole area right here is Whataburger, the Whataburger home office. What are these fast food executives also afraid of? I'm just a teenager making a documentary about. Cancer is greedy. Cancer is deceptive. The current idea that cancer is a genetic disease is based on ideology, not on the science any longer. Cancer is frustrating. We have so much control over our health, and it comes down to diet. Healthcare and medicine is extremely siloed. Cancer is deflating. We spend 40 times more on cures for cancer than researching prevention. Our American society doesn't care about prevention. If you could do anything at all, Joe, what would you do? I said I'd cure cancer. Cancer is the monster hiding under all of our beds, waiting to creep into our lives. In 2020, I had about 150 patients with cancer. 12 days after the diagnosis of my mom was dead, and that is truly a preventative unnecessary death. I have also lost someone to cancer. My grandpa Hank was the life of the party. He could always put a smile on your face even if you were in the foulest of moods. Unfortunately, when I was in middle school, I actually remember the exact day when it occurred because I had just gotten back from my soccer practice and my mom sat me down and she said that my grandpa had been diagnosed with cancer. When my mom delivered the news to me, I could tell that just from the tone of her voice, there wasn't much we could do. It was actually around a week later when he ended up passing. Just like that, my grandpa was gone. I felt extremely confused and frustrated because I knew there had to have been another way we could have seen it coming. Did the doctors truly try everything they could? Was there nothing that I could do to impact whether I would develop the exact same disease in my lifetime? Why was it that you could only consider options to make it better once he had already been diagnosed? 
These questions are what drove me to research and chase after the cure for cancer. For those of you thinking, who even are you? I'm Grace Price. I'm 17 years old and I go to a high school called Alpha. Through learning on AI applications at my school, I'm able to learn twice as fast as the average high school student and finish all of my schoolwork in two hours in the morning. This opens up time in my afternoons to work on an extremely ambitious project that you're about to learn more about. I've always been passionate about health. In fact, when I was little, my parents showed me the documentary Fed Up which was basically about how excessive amounts of sugar in the foods that we eat every day have actually led to America's obesity crisis. This created an entire new world of understanding for me and what health could really look like. I started learning all that I could about the amounts of sugars that were in specific foods that my friends and I were eating every single day. There's 65 grams of sugar in this bottle of Coke. I might as well show you another comparison while we're here. This orange juice was an old favorite of mine. I used to drink about a glass and a half of this every morning. Instead of my normal fixing of orange juice, I might as well have just drank a bottle of Coke. This obsession continued into high school. However, it wasn't until my junior year when my entire understanding of health changed. That summer, my dad introduced me to a topic I'd never heard of. It was called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the inheritable chemical alterations to our DNA that are reversible and impacted by our environment. Now in much simpler terms, you can think of epigenetics as little tags that have the power to turn a gene on and off, just like a light switch. You can think of our DNA as the script and our epigenetics as the actors deciding exactly how each line should be read. The most incredible thing about epigenetics is that the changes are impacted by our environment unlike our DNA, which is permanent. Our epigenetics are impacted by lifestyle factors, such as sleep, air quality, exercise, and most importantly, diet. In fact, the food that we eat can cause epigenetic alterations that can lead to cancer proliferation. I decided I was going to find the prevention and cure for cancer through the connection between food and epigenetics. I started spending every day reading at least two or three articles in the afternoon on the topic. I would then summarize this information and share it on Twitter. I had to share the good news with people. This new understanding of health could change the world. The average American adult consumes around 17 teaspoons of added sugar each day. This is two to three times greater than the healthy amount. What this means is that we are gaining less and less nutritional value from our food and are eating more refined sugar than ever. Most people eat food with nutritional labels they can't even pronounce. However, this is luckily an easy fix because we just have to start eating real food again instead of someone else's science experiment, right? When you Google future projections of cancer cases, a lot of the sources that come up are positive. For example, the CDC flaunts a decrease in mortality rates from cancer. The National Cancer Institute has endless articles on the amount of progress we've made towards finding a cure for cancer. Even President Biden seems to have a positive outlook on our future for cancer. I said I'd cure cancer, and we can. We can end cancer as we know it. However, the first couple of months of research didn't go as expected. As I read more articles, it became crystal clear that there was never going to be a cure for cancer. At least not in the way that the National Health Institutes were selling it. What would you say the number one cause of cancer is? Uh, that's an interesting question. Oh, I have no idea, honestly. I'd say genetics. Um, genetics. Is it inherited from genes and stuff? So I would think that's the number one cause. Yes, I would say cancer is a genetic disease. Typically, if your parents have it, you're more inclined to have it. Coca-Cola whistleblower and True Bed co-founder Callie Means joins me. The biggest problem in the country is the fact that we let ourselves get fatter, sicker, more depressed, more infertile at an increasing rate while bankrupting the country. Our institutions, particularly the healthcare industry, uh, has completely let us down. I was born at 12 pounds, and the doctors said to my mom, that's perfectly normal. And then 
A couple years later, she had trouble losing weight. She was obese. And they said, that's normal. You know, 50% of people your age are obese, no problem. A couple years later, she had high blood sugar, put on metformin. A couple years later, had high cholesterol, put on a statin. A couple years later, high blood pressure, put on an ACE inhibitor. So you look back, you know, in the 20, 30 years after I was born, there were all these siloed rites of passage for an American patient. And even going to my birth, she wasn't told this at the time, but a large baby, it's called fetal macanoma, is a high indicator of metabolic dysfunction for the mother. My own birth weight was a sign uh, that something wrong was going on in the root cause. You know, my mom, who by the way, even on six medications, was an average patient. The average person her age is on more than six medications. She was actually called healthy by her doctors at 71. And she was taking a hike with my dad and felt a pain in her stomach and went in to get a scan. And she was told the next day that she had stage four pancreatic cancer. 12 days after the diagnosis of my mom was dead, and that is truly a preventable, unnecessary death. Now the doctors, the top oncologists in the world, uh, who she was talking to at Stanford, said that this was unlucky. But the key point, I think, in this story, and that's relevant to millions of people, is that it wasn't unlucky. There were warning signs for 40 years. Why are the cancer societies, the American Diabetes Association, accepting money from products, from Coca-Cola, that's literally causing the uptick in these conditions? I think it's because there's no understanding and just a willful denial of the link between food and illnesses, which is really convenient. You hear these wealthy people say, oh, I've got the best doctor in the world. You know, bragging that you've got the best doctor after you get heart disease, after you get cancer, that's like bragging of the best mechanic after you totally crash the car. Everyone just jumps into action. You know, you cancel work. You're gonna battle chemotherapy. Where's that mindset before the car crashes? Why have we gaslighted everyone to be fighting once, once it crashes, but not ringing the alarm bells before? Where else but in the fountain where they serve ice cold Coca-Cola? In the past, the American Cancer Society has accepted a $1.9 million fund from Coca-Cola. This is with the knowledge that the overconsumption of sugar can lead to increased risk of obesity and cancer. There's nothing like ice cold Coca-Cola. Not only... Okay, so I'm just going to pause that there for a sec. Um, yeah, this is going to be a really good documentary, and they do talk about the seed oils and things like that coming up. But... Like Kelly Means, um, now I, I've done a video on Kelly Means before. Uh, I suggest you go check it out. He has great interviews with uh, a lot of people. Um, yeah, sugar is a huge problem, and uh, yeah, I, it's my belief that it's the it's the addiction part that keeps us, um, you know, addicted to the foods that are full of seed oils, which do most of the damage. But uh, like Kelly just said that, like, uh, you know, bragging that you've got a great doctor after you've already crashed the car sort of thing. It's not just that, you know, we think that or we know that, you know, this, this food is bad for us and everything like that. It's also the education, you know, the education system, it keeps us on a low-fat low diet, you know. Like I, and one of the underlying problems for my blood cancer was a low-fat diet. It leads to rabbit starvation. Your lymphatic system is designed to absorb fat, okay? We are, that is our primary energy source and it should be our primary energy source. We should not be eating carbohydrates of any kind. Um, our diet, you know, should be high fat, high protein. Um, now, the problem is the lymphatic system, you know, if you, you, if you, on a, on a low fat diet, obviously you're not getting the nutrients that you need for your body, and your lymphatic system is still going to pick up the oils, and that's when I think you get poisoned. But uh, we'll continue with this because I, I, I think this documentary is going to be really good. And, you know, again, this girl, uh, Grace Price, she's just 17 years old, and I just think it's amazing, you know. This completely unethical, it also reveals that there is a deeper incentive behind these large health organizations than one would expect. The American Heart Association accepts funds from Kellogg's and Coke. The American Diabetes Association accepts funds from Coke. The list goes on. The easiest way to understand why certain products are promoted as healthy is to follow the money. Foods that increase cancer risk 
also increase risk for other chronic diseases. When we are younger, we are taught that illnesses and diseases are all different and not related. But I've come to find that this isn't the case. This is when I started reading about all of the foods that increased risk for the most chronic diseases. None of these foods were that surprising or complicated. If you want to improve the quality of your life, it starts with the nutrients that you're putting in your body. So most people now are coming home from the hospital with boost or insure, and they're seeing this as like their ticket to health. And it, it couldn't be further from the truth. These kind of things are filled with garbage oils and loaded with sugar. Sugar's often the second ingredient. And sugar we know is fueling tumors. So I know that you earned your clinical doctorate. I was wondering how often nutrition and lifestyle factors were brought up when you were earning this degree. That's a good question and the answer is kind of sad. Healthcare and medicine is extremely siloed. For example, when I was in graduate school, we spoke about nutrition for about a half a day. And and I want to compare that to, you know, taking an entire semester of pharmacology, you know, to help understand yeah. like what kind of drugs our patients are are taking. Okay, again, yeah, another clin uh, clinician or doctor, you know, admitting that, you know, nutrition wise, all they study is like half a day compared to like a whole semester of uh, pharmaceuticals and all that sort of stuff. Um, again, I don't think this is anything new, um, but what I, I do like about it is that this is uh, just a young girl out there trying to bring another documentary out and showing, you know, you know cancer as a food-borne uh, illness. Um, which shows to me that people are waking up and even the younger generation. And I just, and I think that's very impressive. Here we go. Taking. So it, it's not enough. While my conversations with Callie and Dr. Lindy were extremely informative, I felt as though I had even more questions than before. I decided to take my mission out of state. So I flew to Orlando, Florida seeking answers from someone who's been researching the intersection of nutrition and diseases for a long time. Dr. Kate Shanahan joins us now. She helps the Lakers eat better, and now she wants to do the same for you. You say don't buy low fat, don't buy low cholesterol, don't buy fat free. So these are the books that uh, we've already written. As a family medicine doctor, I was practicing in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and I had gone to medical school because I wanted to get to the root causes of, well, selfishly, my own problems, mm -hmm. because as as an athlete in college and high school, I had recurring connective tissue problems. I got every kind of itis. I got bursitis, tendonitis. I felt like there had to be a reason. And so I really hoped to learn these kinds of root cause um, explanations when I went to medical school. And nothing, nothing like that happened. I was a little bit sad and disillusioned with the actual practice of medicine itself because I felt like giving people drugs for their blood pressure and just monitoring their kidney function and looking at their blood levels of cholesterol and giving them drugs for that. It didn't keep them out of the hospital. It wasn't improving their quality of life. So I was totally desperate for a solution. In the book, Spontaneous Healing, there was a term that was a biochemical term. It was essential fatty acids. I dove into the biochemistry of these essential fatty acids. When I did that, I realized that I was already getting a lot of them and they were really so prevalent that maybe I was getting too much. And I also recognized that they were biochemically unstable. And this was where things got really interesting for me because I was like, this is really important. It's not something I was taught in medical school. Doctors don't know anything about this biochemical stress. And I think it might be making a lot of these chronic diseases so prevalent right now. It's really a very simple principle. It's just that it's so abstract. Unless you're a chemist, 
And also, unless you're very familiar with how the cell is built, especially with the fact that the cell membrane is built out of largely polyunsaturated fatty acids, it's like whoosh, doesn't mean anything. And this is where, unfortunately, you know, most health professionals are. It, the few times that I've actually gotten some, you know, national press, it was very easy for the folks from Harvard and Tufts to come flying in and correct the record and basically say, uh, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with polyunsaturated fats. The problem is that we don't care enough about our health and then the usual talking points, it's all our fault. The way we go about nutrition science is actually not as scientific as just looking at the chemistry. And it turns out that a lot of chemists warned that vegetable oils, which are high in these polyunsaturated fatty acids that make us sick. They warned in the 50s and 60s that these things were not something we should base our diets on. They warned that they have a tendency to interact with oxygen and that could be really bad. They warned that they could even cause things like cancer, believe it or not. And they warned that they could probably cause heart attacks and strokes. But doctors don't have a clue. So they completely disrespected all of that. Who was in the right here? Was it these chemists that nobody's heard of? Or was it Harvard and the American Heart Association? It would be like eating this many grapes. You may be wondering, why is this happening and how is this even legal? Well, it all started back in the 1980s when the USDA and HHS created the first dietary guidelines for Americans. Refrigeration was all the rage. These national health organizations were being funded by the exact companies that were pushing for the use of industrial oils as cooking oils, the elimination of fats in foods, the addition of refined sugars to make up for the awful taste of fatless foods, and of course, the chemicals in our dinner. Carbs were great but fat and protein needed to be limited. Studies were funded by these companies to show that foods in their natural forms are more risky than the science experiment companies call food nowadays. 95% of the 2020 U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee had a conflict of interest with the big food and big pharma. Greater than 60% were research funds and affiliations with executive boards. This is how nutrition misinformation trickles down from the government to doctors and then to us. The current uh, idea that cancer is a genetic disease is based on ideology not on, um, uh, on the science any longer. The NIH gives uh, millions and millions of dollars every year to research uh, genetic mutations in cancer. And now we know that many normal cells have all these same kinds of mutations that never develop cancer. We've spent billions and billions of dollars on the Cancer Genome Project. We're funding millions of grant dollars throughout the whole system and all the top cancer centers. Immunotherapies uh, are based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer. So when you put all that together, it's too radical and painful or upsetting to an entire industry to say that you might not be doing the right thing. The problem is the field has not yet come to know this. The cancer field is still wallowing in hunting for gene mutations, and if that's not the correct theory, the outcome is never going to be optimal. You have to know there's two aspects here. One of them is management, which most people are interested in. The second part of your question is how do we prevent us from getting into that in the first place? And that's, you gotta keep your mitochondria healthy. So it's very hard to get cancer with healthy mitochondria. Our American society, and perhaps other societies as well, doesn't care about prevention. Because if they did, there would be no obesity epidemic. But there is. So that tells us the society doesn't really care about cancer prevention. Just what can you do for me after I get cancer? Every now and then you could have a treat and eat one of these things or a pizza or whatever. But if you eat this stuff constantly, you're going to put yourself at risk for systemic inflammation, which is going to lead to damage to mitochondria, and you're going to then fall into a fermentation metabolism, cell division out of control, and you can get radiation, chemo, immunotherapies, something that will cause your body to be brutalized. When you see that uh, cancer is getting worse and worse, and, and striking earlier and earlier. And it's now gonna replace heart disease as the number one uh, killer of people. I can't believe how many people in their 35, they, they just started their families. 
right? They've got three kids in there. They're all little kids and the woman has metastatic breast cancer. The guy's got metastatic colon cancer or something like this. Obesity has now replaced smoking as the number one risk factor. It's all a big money game. And it's, it's dollars first, patient outcome second. It's so scary that the folks that are treating patients are almost clueless as to the very biology of the disease they're treating. Consequently, have all these dead people. It's like brutal death. Your body is wasted away, your hair falls out, you're bleeding from everywhere, you're surgically mutilated. I mean, this is nuts. This is completely nuts. We don't have to have that. You're going to put yourself at risk for systemic inflammation, which is going to lead to damage to mitochondria, and you're going to then fall into a fermentation metabolism, cell division out of control, and you can get radiation, chemo, immunotherapies, something that will cause your body to be brutalized. When you see that uh, cancer is getting worse and worse and, and striking earlier and earlier, and it's now gonna replace heart disease as the number one uh, killer of people, I can't believe how many people in their 35, they, they just started their families. Right? They've got three kids in there. They're all little kids and the woman has metastatic breast cancer. The guy's got metastatic colon cancer or something like this. Obesity has now replaced smoking as the number one risk factor. It's all a big money game. And it's, it's dollars first, patient outcome second. It's so scary that the folks that are treating patients are almost clueless as to the very biology of the disease they're treating. Consequently, have all these dead people. It's like brutal death. Your body is wasted away, your hair falls out, you're bleeding from everywhere, you're surgically mutilated. I mean, this is nuts. This is completely nuts. We don't have to have that. Yeah, like Thomas Seafood says, we don't have to have that. Um, and I highlighted that because, you know, that's what I've been through. I've been through that myself. You know, I was stage four twice. I went through all the chemotherapies, um, heavy dose, for three years, and I was brutalized. My body was brutalized. I was cooked. I was, you know, had all kinds of problems. Most people uh, listening, you know, you go back and have a look at my story. Um, it is a brutal situation when you're going through those treatments, and largely it's because. People just the people doing the treatment, like Thomas Seyfried said, they just don't understand the the disease at all. Um, so who who is to blame? Can we prevent it ourselves? Well, yes, we can. But the thing is, you know, the food industry owns the education. The food industry owns all the propaganda that goes, you know, go, all these foundations and like they said, they do all the funding for the research. So well so-called research, okay? Our education is all geared towards low fat, okay? And as I said before, your lymphatic system is designed to absorb fat. We are supposed to have a high-fat diet. Um, and, you know, a low-fat diet was one of the underlying issues I had. I wasn't obese. I was very lean, you know? I was uh, very lean and fit. Um, I didn't have... Uh, a food, so much a food addiction. I was, um, yeah, of course I was human. I, I did have my binges like on a weekend or something, something like that um, every now and then. Uh, it wasn't a constant thing, you know, uh, low fat. Uh, but the problem is the, when you're, the fitness industry as well is as much to blame. You know, the fitness industry foods are all very high in seed oils. Okay, and artificial sweeteners and things like that. So, you know, protein powders and, you know, protein butter, everything that you think is healthy. So anyway, um, this I think is one to look for. Okay, keep an eye out for cancer as a foodborne illness and uh, go check it out when, it come, um, when it's finished, okay? And I hope you all enjoy that one and I'll see you again very soon.